Welcome to Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Each week, we talk with industry leaders in both marketing and entrepreneurship and business to find out all about their wins and failures in marketing. Right now, we'll hear all about their successes and wins and what's fallen flat so that you can take that knowledge and implement it. Learn from the best, from the folks who've been there and done it all, as well as people just like you. Thanks for joining us. This is Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. And welcome to what is our very first inaugural episode of the Market Pulse podcast. I'm absolutely over the moon. We've been planning this for a few weeks now. I'm over the moon with the response that we've had from all the fantastic guests that we've invited to the show. And on today's show, the very first pilot episode, I want to welcome a big warm welcome to Kerry Gard. A little bit about Kerry before we get started is Kerry's the CEO of MKG Marketing, a digital agency that works with cybersecurity marketers. Wow, tough market, tough crowd. We aim to help complex brands build trust with their customers through SEO and digital advertising. And Kerry's on a personal mission to bring their people first culture to as many as possible, whether that's directly through team members and clients or externally through writing and podcast guesting. We'll hand over to Kerry in just a moment so we can hear a little bit more in depth about how she got where she is and a little bit more about MKG. Just before we get into that, I've got a special announcement is that we've managed to land a sponsor for the show. I really wasn't expecting at this stage, so I'm absolutely over the moon to announce that. And so we've got a little pre-roll advert for our guest sponsors, which is uh, gridbank.io. So if you're listening to this, you know that I'm all about building content at scale. Sometimes you just need faceless video reels to get content out there. The problem with a lot of footage banks is that they just don't look native to social and that actually hinders content performance. So gridbank.io is a database of endless vertical authentic video clips. Great for pumping out concepts, A-B test thumbnails and creating authentic looking edits. And if you're looking to get ahead on socials without burning out your team, you can get 10% off your annual subscription with code Paul and you'll not regret it. It's really cool. So thanks to uh, Grid Bank for sponsoring the show today, without without which we probably wouldn't be here, to be fair. And Kerry, back to yourself. Can we start with your fun fact? Fun fact. Did I write one down? Because, yeah, so I guess my fun fact I have is I have a couple back pocket here. One is I went to school, to university, to college for photography, not for marketing at all. I fell into marketing for the sheer fact that I wanted to be in New York City come hell or high water. And marketing was the easiest way to do that, not by being a photographer. But I, it was a wonderful passion of mine for a very long time. And yeah, I dabble here and there awesome to hear. It's fantastic. Kerry, would love to hear a little bit more about that journey that you've been on to get where you are. We're super proud to have you as the very first guest of the show. And the, mm-hmm. obviously the, the focus of the podcast is one of two things, depending on who the guest is. First up, it might be a business owner who is willing to share some of the challenges and tribulations that they've had along the way of marketing their own business, what works for them and what doesn't. And for the marketers amongst us who appear on the show, I just want to share a bit of your expertise with other business owners who might be listening. But just before we get there, what's the story? How did you end up running your own marketing agency, Kerry? The short story is that I met my business partner at our previous agency. It was a boutique shop in Seattle, Washington. And it was just the two of us running the media, the digital marketing media department. Display ads mostly. We weren't even in paid search at the time. Display, so big display campaigns for companies like Alaska Airlines, Cedar sinai And there was a company that showed up, a travel company, that wanted this boutique shop in Seattle to run their ads. And the, I love this boutique agency. They are wonderful, but they're a creative shop. At the end of the day, they were really good at creative, and they happened to have a digital media department. We were a sort of by the way. So when a company showed up and said that they wanted to do just digital ads and no creative, the creative shop was like, this is small potatoes for us. We really want to do run the whole thing. So they turned them down. But my business partner and I were so excited about the possibility because being a travel company online at the time and being able to actually measure ROI end to end through display ads was an anomaly and something we were chasing, having been on the call with some big brands like Western Digital 
Cedar sinai like I mentioned, and them going, great, we spent a bunch of money with you now. How much money do we make? And us going, we didn't measure that because we can't, because you're selling your product in Best Buy. But you got this many impressions. Look at how many people saw your ad. We were really tired of having that conversation. So when this travel company showed up and said we could actually measure business outcomes, we jumped at the idea and asked if they were okay with us pitching the business as an independent shop, knowing that we'd be doing the work anyway. And they gave us a shot. And we put together a pitch deck. And we were called MKKG. And in a tiny Starbucks in Seattle, we sat down with this person and gave them our spiel. And we didn't win the business because of some, that, that sounds like they never actually picked an agency. I don't know what was going on there, but maybe we dodged a blow. But we stood up a company because we were like, what if it comes down? Like, we'll need something. And so we became MKG as an LLC pretty much within a few weeks of that pitch. And my husband had just gotten a job at Netflix and I, we were moving down to San Jose. And so I said to, to my business partner, how do you feel about San Francisco? And he said, let's go. And so we were off. We were down in the valley and we were a business making it happen. That's amazing, Kerry. That's amazing. So it's not only a journey of entrepreneurship that you've been on, but also having, it sounds like you've met the right person to be in business with, which is, I'm sure lots of people are sat at home listening to this, hopefully anyway, thinking, geez, like having somebody else to take to shoulder some of that burden who's so aligned to you must be something that's really important to you both now. Like I imagine you buy, you guys are really strong together. We've been, MKG has been around for over 10 years now. So we started in 2011, so 13 years, and we've been partners oh, the amazing. whole time. And yes, absolutely. We've been on the journey together between marriages, children, multiple moves. My I moved back up to Seattle and then again across the Atlantic to the UK. My business partner moved from San Francisco to New Orleans. So we've both done some pretty big moves and been business partners through it all. That's a fantastic story. I love it. I love it. It just goes to show that sometimes you just need to walk through the door when they open, because I always say like when a door closes, you can never be sure whether it'll open again or not. And you're talking to a guy who founded a new business last year, one week before his son was born. I took on a second business in, in August of last year. Because similar sort of story, a very good friend of mine described his ideal co-founder to me and it sounded very much like me and it turned out it was based on me. He was trying to get me to find him another co-founder and, and, and I just said yes. Kerry, you've explained a little bit about the origins of MKG Market and what is it we heard a little in your bio at the beginning around your people first culture and I certainly resonate with that having spent sort of 15 years in retail leadership. What is it about MKG that sets you guys apart in a, what is quite a crowded market space, market space traditionally? What is it that kind of separates you guys out there? In 2011, it was just Mike and I for a few years until we met our very first employee who was a dad and we weren't parents at the time. And so to have somebody on our team who was a father of two just made a huge impact on us in regards to ensuring they had a strong work-life balance. And we were fully remote. We've been fully remote the whole time. Like I mentioned, I was in San Jose, Mike was in San Francisco, this person was in Portland, and then we moved around a bunch. So we've been remote since day one. And it's very easy when you're remote and the rest of the world is in person to work too much. And we were working way too much, checking emails at eight, 10 o'clock at night, trying to go to bed after that, which is not a good idea. And we put our foot down probably six months into working with this person and said, we can't, this is unsustainable, especially for somebody who's a dad. And so we need to have some boundaries around our work-life balance. And we need to do that as soon as humanly possible for all of our sanities. And we put a stake in the ground and made sure that was always the case. So we don't care. We're across four time zones now. There's about 12 of us. And I always say, I don't care what your working hours are, but they have to be consistent so we can plan accordingly. And they can be, as long as you, your day, your, they don't have to be the same every single day, but it needs to be consistent every single week. And that really opens up the flexibility for people who have kids, who are morning people like myself, who <laughs> operate differently than the normal nine to five. And it's been really crucial that 
we've had that from day since we've hired this person. And in that, we've instilled all of our systems and processes to back it up. So we, because we work with a lot of B2B tech companies, we've adopted the Agile framework. If you've heard of Scrum and Agile, yeah. we do sprint planning, we do stand-ups, and we do retrospectives. And part of that is something called velocity. So instead of time, everybody loves a good timesheet. They're the worst. Yeah. So instead of time tracking, we actually plan ahead. We use velocity to say, how much time does everybody have every week? What needs to get done? And how do we marry those two things together, thinking ahead versus looking behind? And so in doing that, we can really ensure that people only work seven hours a day and what percent of that is actually billable versus internal meetings we want to have, coffee chats we want to plan for, those sort of things that allows us to really naturally, without a huge lift, ensure that work-life balance all the time. And that allows us to not only be there for our employees and ensure that they do the best work that they possibly can for their clients, but it also allows us to set boundaries with clients. If you want something done in the next week, we need to have it by Thursday. If you need us to do something that things come up all the time, absolutely no problem, then we need to push something. So what is it that we're going to push? And so it allows us to really set those clear expectations with clients, which they love. They're like, thank you. Thank you for being able to plan ahead and think ahead so that we can easily agile and maneuver with these things that pop up while also making sure we hit deadlines and you're not over-promising on something you're not delivering on. So that's really where that people first has come into the company, which has helped both the team and the clients and one of our differentiators a moment. Absolutely. I love that. Being able to manage the unknown unknowns, like people just fail consistently to expect them even, and yet they happen every week in, week out. And when they do happen, it's a crisis every time. And I've always, I've developed my own sort of style of working around those unknown unknowns and making sure there's enough buffer time built into each day. But then that there are, that not you don't get them every single day. So then having things online that you can just get on with when the unknown unknowns happily don't appear, it's nice to know that you're still working productively. Okay, so to move on then, one of the things that I'm going to be asking quite regularly of our marketing guests is around what has been the market and challenges for the day. I guess that's it's quite a broad scope, right? It could be versus two, three years ago. It could just be within the last six to 12 months. What have you seen that is impacting the market heavily right now that you guys are having to deal with on behalf of your clients? The buyers changed. How the buyer buy buys has drastically changed. It's a buyer's market. It's like when you're buying a house, right? It's either a buyer's market or a seller's market. And if you're a seller and it's a seller's market, you can basically make whatever terms you want to accept. And the buyer's going to figure out how to come and meet those terms. And on the other side, if it's a buyer's market, you're probably going to take a pretty big hit as a seller. I can speak from experience. We certainly did. Hurt like hell. But that's where we are. We're in a complete buyer's market right now from a B2B tech marketing world, whether it's SaaS or a more enterprise product. And it's because they have a lot of choice, maybe too much choice. I don't know. But they don't want cold calls. They don't want to be bothered. They want you to just leave them alone and let them do their job. And they will raise their hand when they're ready and they have a problem. And this has completely shifted how we have to market. Cold outreach, I'm going to, I'm going to call it and say it's dead. I think a lot of people probably still disagree with me. They're holding on to it for dear life. But the sooner you can accept that cold outreach is dead, the sooner you can move on and get on with your life and get back to some of the basics, which is brand awareness and demand gen and these things that we put on hold and said, it's all about the leads and we got to do bottom of the funnel and we have to do white papers and we have to gate everything. And those days are gone. It's time to let the buyer give as much information as she possibly can, be as helpful as humanly possible, and then be there when they're ready to say, I have specific questions, I'm ready to make a buying decision, and now I need to talk to a person. That's really been the big shift since I would say, I think it started right before accelerated it, and now it's here to stay. Interesting. So I guess combining that, What's the top piece of marketing advice right now that seems to be working well, either for you as a business or for your clients that kind of combats that situation? 
First and foremost, make sure your SEO sound. So from the foundational elements to knowing what keywords, think about keywords in terms of problems that you solve, right? So don't just think about them as terms of product. We have this product and this is what the product does. Think about it in terms of how people are looking for your solution. And then you can tailor your website to talk about why your solution is different than others and what makes you a, a great option and then people can find you. So if you have that good SEO foundation and you have those keywords wired up appropriately and you can start to build the brand in a way that's higher level from a content standpoint. Content is not going anywhere. It's still 100% the monarchy and you need to have a good strong content push in some regard, whether it's podcasting, whether it's multiple social channels that you're constantly publishing to and helpful tips and tricks. Video is great. So however you can get out there on video to talk about your customer and how you know them and how you know the problems that they're having. And in a way that you show up and you create that brand awareness, because the beauty of SEO is that it can capture that brand really easily. When people see your ads and they start investigating, oh, I am having that problem. I'm going to go search for it right? Yep. Then you can start marrying these things together. But this is the beauty of what we do, right? Digital ads and SEO. It's why we do both of those things because you need both and you need one to serve the top of the funnel and then you need the other to capture it. And I guess that's leading into a side question that I had whilst you were talking about that is I see some of the same issues that you guys have that, that I have is around that everybody wants to know how many leads you've generated from the work that you've just done. And yet a lot of marketing and certainly SEO, brand building, personal branding, it's a long-term game and it's all not always directly attributable. So how are you guys handling those conversations with clients? Is that still a tough talk for you guys as well? It is. And we have to meet in the middle because they still have a board and they still have CMOs and VPs to answer to. And so the easiest thing for them to show progress on is lead volume. Whether those leads are leading to revenue or not, that's the conversation that they then have to have internally. And what we set the conversation up as of yes to leads, and we can help you get those. And you need to do these other things to support that system. Otherwise, it's going to dry up really fast. Or it's not going to happen fast enough. And you're going to be frustrated that like you don't have leads like yesterday. So it's a yes and conversation. And you can't just go after leads. If you want to just go after leads, then go sign up for content syndication all day. The leads will be incredibly cold. You'll have to do a ton of nurture to get them to where you want to go. But if leads are all that matter at the end of the day, your money is better spent over there. Absolutely. I always tell people to build it before you need it. I see so many CEOs, especially tech, they've got, they've come from that industry. They've built a product that they would have wanted when they were on the other side of the desk. If I build it, they will come and they sell it to their network when it's in pilot stage and it's still a bit doesn't quite work the way it should do. And so you get a really low conversion rate from their immediate network that probably should be the longer term customers. And then all of a sudden that dries up and mm -hmm. I then get the phone calls and I'm sure you get them as well as the pipeline's dead. <laughs> how do we, how many leads can we get in 30 days? I'm like, none, none. And you can come back in 30 more days and I'll tell you the same answer. And another 30 days, I'll tell you the same answer. You've got to build it six months before you need it. But I understand at the same time, it's super hard. It's like being on a diet, right? If dieting was easy, everybody would have the body shape that they want to have. Everybody would look the way they would ideally like to look. The fact of the matter is it's hard because you've got to put the results in even when you're not seeing the outputs directly day by day. And it's the little things that matter, the little things that, that sounds like what you guys are doing. It's just chipping away at that 1% of their brand and building them until you start to get the consistent outputs back. I would agree with you because I think it's important what you're saying because there's so many times you have startups who show up and they're like, I have a thing to sell and I want to sell it now. And to your point, it's that leads conversation that, in each, that initially starts down to then the revenue. And so... If you have a product that's in beta, if you can start to your point, those foundational elements, especially in SEO, like you don't have to start spending money, but you can get the SEO dialed in so that to your point, then when you do start spending, then yes, it will still probably take 30, 60 days, but it'll happen. You'll have, you just have to kind of fill the top and then it'll flow down, but get those, get your email situated, get your SEO grounded. You could pay, maybe do a little bit of paid just to start getting some of those beta testers in and see where your keywords are following and see where your users are. But don't wait 
to your point, don't wait till you have the thing. Like, start as soon as humanly possible yeah. to start marketing it. Because, yeah, it does. It takes, it is not a faucet. Everybody has this notion that digital advertising is a faucet. You just turn it on when you need it and turn it off when you're done. And it's, no, oh, not anymore. Nope. But it's okay, easy yeah. to assume that because <laughs> it looks that way from the outside. When you see successful sure. founders who are really good at building their brand on social media, it seems that way. But that's the same as being a great footballer or an athlete of some sort. They make it look easy. But what you don't see is the 10,000 hours of practice they've put in before that point to get to where they are. And everybody just assumes, oh, they were born with it. They've got natural talent. And your yeah, genetics and talent do have do play into it. But absolutely, the practice that gets there. So 100%. And then I guess... One last thing, Kerry, is what's one thing that if you could just wear the magic wand, you would stop all of your clients or the people who come to your door that, that aren't a fit for you even, like from doing with their marketing today? What is the one thing that they're doing that really just doesn't add value for them or causes them pain? Now, I mentioned it early on, but cold outreach, it's done. Mm -hmm. Stop wasting. You're doing nothing but burning your brand and making people angry because they don't want it. And so if you have, if you've built a sales team to do nothing but cold outreach all day, then when your leads drive up, you're going to be wondering why you can't build your brand. And that's why, because you just lost the total trust of your customers in that pitch slap, in that cold outreach. They will come to you when they're ready. The best thing you can do is build up that value, build up that brand and be there for them when they're ready to solve that problem. Perfect. Love it. Kerry. Very polarizing opinion on the end there. I like that. And just a shout out, if you're in the audience and you're listening to this and you're a business that's doing really well with your called outreach or you're a marketer who absolutely advocates for called outreach, I would love to have you on the show and have your say as well. This is what it's all about. It's about conversations and it's about bringing good people together and letting business owners out there see what the real world is like from a marketing perspective as well as from the perspective of other business owners. Kerry, this is the first time we've met today, so it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much for agreeing to be our very first guest. And Kerry, how can people contact you if you'd like to know more about your services and your opinions on things? Oh, I live on LinkedIn, so you can definitely come connect with me there. And, and our website is mkgmarketinginc.com. That's M as in Mike, K as in Kerry, G as in guard, and marketinginc.com. Now we know where you got the name from. Fantastic. Thanks very much. And <laughs> thanks for joining us for a very first episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. And we will see you next week for episode number two. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to feature on a future show, or you've got some ideas for folks who would make a great guest, please drop us a line. The contact details are in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Your host today was Paul Banks, founder at Javelin Content Management. Javelin specializes in helping busy business owners just like you to repurpose video content, taking all the stress and tech problems away, and turning your long-form video into literally hundreds of pieces of content without breaking the bank. If you want to launch your personal brand, become the vendor of choice for your audience, or maximize your sales revenue impact, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for the next episode, and don't forget to give us a subscribe and a review. Our podcast is only possible with your support.